Hi, I'm George, kj 6 for you and in this presentation, I'm going to talk about our radio trailer build project. We started out thinking about a project like this for our radio club, and the original idea was to figure out a way that we could do more group operating events. We do field day every year, and at each field day, we haul out lots of radios, antennas, batteries, solar panels, and tools, and just about everything else you can imagine. And that takes a lot of time and effort, both to assemble the stuff, to haul it out and set it up. So we thought that it would be good if we could have some kind of trailer where we could pre-position all of our gear and make it easy to just hitch it up and take it to a site, set up and get on the air in minutes, make it very easy to store the equipment and also to transport it to any site. So the idea of getting a cargo trailer and building out a radio trailer was really born about two years ago. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about in this presentation is the build out itself, the mechanical build. Then we'll talk about the radio equipment, the antennas, the electrical system, and what we found were other useful accessories to have as part of the trailer kit. The trailer itself is a six foot wide, 10 foot long cargo trailer, very common trailer used by landscaping services and hauling cargo. In the interior of the um, trailer is wood paneled and there's a vent on the roof there's a side door and there's also two rear barn doors. And we had a custom roof rack built in order to mount um, solar panels and antennas on the top. And there's also a pair of rear stabilizers. So when we stop, we can put down the stabilizers and have a solid platform. This is a view of the front. On the left-hand side, you can see on the tongue, we added a cargo box. And then on the rear, you can see the uh, stabilizers at the bottom and also the uh, barn doors. On the inside, when we bought the trailer, it was really bare bones. There is plywood on the walls and plywood flooring, and that's about it. So the first thing that we did was to pull all of the plywood paneling off the walls and, um, and put in insulation. So we installed about one and three quarter inch insulation on all of the walls and in the ceiling and put paneling up on the ceiling in addition to replacing the plywood walls. We also put a laminate floating floor so that we didn't scuff up the original plywood. We wanted a plastic surface that would be uh, abrasion resistant and handle spills. So the new flooring was put in very at the very beginning. When we laid out the overall design of the interior, we really wanted this to be an operating station more than anything else. We did not want a cargo hauler where we would throw stuff into the trailer and then just have to dig out a big pile of junk. So we wanted to lay it out in a way where everything was set up and we could just uh, go to a location, set up and be on the air in minutes and not have to lug a bunch of stuff around. When we laid out the design, given the location of the doors, we figured that the left side of the trailer would, would be the operating position and the right side would be used for storage and the front would be used for storage. We did a conceptual design of the operating desks and decided with eight feet of linear space, we could fit two operating positions, two four foot desks. The desks are standard computer tables that you can get off of Amazon. They come with the metal frame and the wood surface we also bought some risers that are bolted to those desks. So the desks were assembled and bolted to the floor and bracketed to the wall. And then the risers were bolted to the desks. So they're very solid. We then added some shelving. You can see two shelves in this position, one at eye level and one up at the very top. And there's also shelving in the front and the sides and we'll get to that in a moment. So the idea was that the tables would be solid and they would be built into the trailer and really not move around at all. In fact, the idea was to keep all the equipment bolted into the trailer for making uh, operating easy. The front wall of the trailer is where we house the battery system and some accessory drawers and the electrical panel. You can see the white box up at the top where the electrical uh, panel is and some sh shutoff switches. And we'll talk more about the detailed electrical wiring in a few slides. You see in these slides, this is in the early days of the construction, so not everything is set up yet. On the right hand side, we made this a very shallow shelving space. The idea was to use typical tool cases like these rigid cases for parts and accessories, rather than to make it a deep space and cut into the operating and uh, sitting area. We wanted to keep these shelves very shallow and have a way to keep those boxes bolted in position. 
the original idea was to use these uh, nylon straps, which turned out not to be the greatest idea, and we came up with a much better approach. And eventually we built out uh, brackets on that wall for antenna mounting and storage. So here you can see uh, the where those uh, storage bins are. It's also where we put our folding chairs. So we bungee the folding chairs in, and we also have a set of these little toolboxes that are held in with a one inch L bracket of aluminum that's screwed to the shelf. So those little uh, boxes contain the most commonly used components and tools. So they're very easy to access. Up on the wall, also in the very shallow mount, are a bunch of these utility hooks. This is where we mount our antennas for storage. So there's HF mobile antennas, carbon fiber mass, loops for two meters and six meters, Pactenna mass for wire verticals, and a storage tube for more wire and, uh, and Yagi elements. Let's talk about the radio gear for a minute. The uh, radio complement is, is pretty uh, complete. The core uh, of the system really is a 7300 as the primary HF station. So when you look at those two operating positions, the right position is HF and the left position by default is VHF. So the ICOM 9700 sits on the left-hand operating position. Both of those radios are permanently mounted in the trailer. In addition to that, we have an ICOM 5100 for two meter FM, UHF FM, and D-Star. And we also have a Motorola XPR 5550, which is an FM and DMR mobile radio. We also added a Flex Radio 6400, and this is uh, used by the club for various events, and we could bolt it into the network rack that's mounted on the wall. This allows us to operate that radio with a Maestro remote control head from anywhere around the campsite. We also added a Shark open spot DMR hotspot. When we have cellular connectivity, we can also run a hotspot out of the trailer. This is the operating position number one, the HF radio. You see the ICOM 7300 in the middle and the computer is mounted right above it. We're using Minix small PCs running Windows and the LCD monitor is bolted to the wall right next to it. In addition to the radio, we also have a bandpass filter switch box in the upper right hand corner. You can see that there's a row of six white buttons. That box lets us switch one of six different bandpasses, bandpass filters for this radio. This way at field day, if we're running multiple HF radios, we can have additional bandpass filtering on this particular radio. There's also a amplified DSP speaker mounted just below the, um, the shelf. Uh, you notice that there is an aluminum um, uh, drop down at the bottom of the shelf. We mounted uh, three LED lamps underneath each, the, the shelf underneath each of the two operating positions and that aluminum barrier keeps the glare out of the operator's eyes. So we have direct LED lighting going downward. One of the things that we learned in the installation is that RF gets into those LED lights, as you would imagine. So we added some chokes to the uh, DC cable going to each of those lights and that eliminated all of the flickering on the LEDs. This is the position to the left. This is the VHF station, the ICOM 9700, also with the same kind of PC and display. Uh, and you can see to the upper right hand corner, the XPR 5550 DMR radio. Right below that, there's also additional optional Anderson power poles on a rig runner. And there's also USB and USB-C charging jacks right below that for the operator's convenience. Above the main shelf there, you'll see on the wall, uh, we put some maps. So local maps, uh, nationwide maps, and an additional monitor. That larger monitor is hooked up to the server which is running the logging server program. And we could use that as a general purpose display. So if we use this in, at a public setting, each of the working stations can have their own logbook or whatever software we're showing on that screen. And then this display could show how we're doing overall for the contest, or we can show other useful information like satellite passes or, or other radio related information for visitors. Here's a picture of uh, two of our operators on field day. That's John KJ6K in the background and James KG6SKK. They were operating the HF station at this point since we were down in a valley and had very little VHF coverage. We could have put another HF radio at the second position, but we just decided to do other HF radio ops on the outside of the trailer. So James is logging and John is working the HF station. Here you can see another shot of the work position where James is logging uh, using N3FJP on the HF station. Field day, there was a huge amount of activity and I, I grabbed this screen snapshot from the 7300. I've never seen so many stations on the air at one time with this radio, so we had to grab a picture. 
Here's a picture of John KD6JL, uh, another one of our key operators, and he was using his ICOM 705 outside of the trailer using uh, one of these uh, low-cost tablet uh, Windows uh, machines for logging. One of the nice things about the trailer is that it becomes the hub for the, the field day operation. Even if you have additional stations outside the trailer, you can take advantage of antennas that are mounted to the trailer or the power system of the trailer if you like. Another station that we operated was the uh, Flex Radio 6400. The Flex Radio is mounted in the network rack inside the trailer and we use the Maestro remote control head, Wi-Fi connected back to the 6400. So in this uh, operating position, we had another one of those Windows tablets and the Maestro about 50 feet away from the trailer. And it's really easy to operate just the remote control head, whether operating sideband or CW, the radio being mounted back in the trailer itself. Here's a picture of uh, myself operating CW with the Maestro. And it was really a, a lot of fun. It was, it was great to try this, uh, this kind of a setup. I really enjoyed it because you don't have to have a huge battery and uh, coax cables and a bunch of stuff where your operating position is. All that is pre-located in the trailer. So you can imagine if you go to a demonstration site where you want to pull out the HF radio and set it up on a table outside of the trailer, you don't have to take out the radio and the battery and the coax cable and a bunch of extra stuff. You just take out the control head, the mic and the paddle, and you're all set to go. We also noticed that at our field day site, we had not only hams, we had pigs. <laughs> so we had a herd of seven feral pigs trundle through our campsite, three big ones and five little guys or four little guys uh, headed through the site. So we did have a mix of both feral pigs and feral hams at field day this year. Let's talk a little bit about antenna. This is a plan view of the trailer. You can see that there's uh, multiple mount points for, uh, for antennas. And one of the big questions was, how do we permanently mount antennas or mount antenna mounts so it's easy to add them? So we had a couple of thoughts for that. One was we wanted to have a traditional HF mobile antenna that was very easy to set up. So in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that there's a Tar Heel HF vertical mounted there. And normally that would be loaded in the trailer and just screwed in place when we get to the site. The other three mount points, the big circles in red, are places where we used clamps to hold the carbon fiber masts. And we'll talk about how those masts were holding up antennas. And generally for field day, we, we use the upper left uh, uh, mast for uh, a vertical. We used a fiberglass uh, pack tenna, uh, 10 meter mast and a wire. And that was connected to a ICOM AH4 antenna tuner on the outside of the trailer. The other two points down at the rear of the trailer were used for the uh, carbon fiber mast to hold up other antennas. So here's a view of the, um, of the trailer. This is a carbon fiber mast mounted to the side of the trailer. And you can see the little white box is the ICOM random wire tuner. Uh, using a carbon fiber mast to hold up the wire is not a great idea. So when uh, operating in that configuration, we would not use the carbon fiber mast, we'd use a fiberglass mast and that worked out really well. The kind of clamps that we used are these uh, mast clamps. These are actually designed for uh, using, uh, used in uh, audio and video production, like stage production work. So you might have this kind of um, tower section kind of structure, these struts, and these uh, two inch clamps are used to attach lighting to these uh, overhead or vertical risers. So we like this idea a lot because uh, we want again to set up the, the site quickly and take it down quickly. So we can just um, lever these open. We can stick the carbon fiber mass or the fiberglass mast in them and then clamp it down and it just sets up really quickly. So those worked out really well. Uh, it turns out that we, we had to extend the lower unit about an inch away from the body of the trailer. And up at the top, we were able to mount the clamps directly to the, um, the roof rack that we had mounted. Um, for the extension at the bottom, what we discovered was uh, these one, two, three blocks. These are normally used for machine work, for machining uh, metal things. Uh, they're fairly precise at one inch by two inch by three inches, and they're pre-drilled, including three eighths inch taps. So it was very easy to uh, kick out the, um, the mast clamp one inch from the trailer by using the one inch profile using two big lag bolts and then a screw to hold everything together. And this worked out really very well. You can see here's uh, two of the clamps mounted to the roof rack. And uh, in this case, we're uh, using that roof rack clamp set to hold the fiberglass pole. That fiberglass pole extends up um, about 32 and a half feet 
and that holds up the wire that's going to the AH4. You might also notice the AH4 has a optional ground wire that we attach with a lug down at the bottom, and it also uses the chassis of the trailer as a ground. Uh, this is a, a shot of a couple of the other antennas. On the left-hand side, you can see the Tar Heel HF mobile whip. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, one of the uh, carbon fiber masts. That mast went up about uh, 40 feet, and we have a two-meter loop and a six-meter loop, and also a cellular antenna mounted to that one uh, for some internet connectivity. Inside the trailer for routing uh, cables, for, for RF cables, uh, we have potentially many antennas and many radios. And so rather than putting in uh, coax switches, we decided to go with a patch bay approach. So here you can see a row of BNC connectors. All of the antennas, all of the coax cables run to the patch panel and all of the radios run to the patch panel. So you can see the list on the right hand side there. In red, you can see the various different antennas. So the HF antennas, the 7300, the 6400. Uh, then the ICOM 9700 has three antenna connectors for each of the bands, uh, plus the, um, the DMR and D-Star radios and a spare. So those all come to BNC connectors. And then all of the antennas also come to the BNCs. So we have multiple VHF, UHF verticals, the Tar Heel, the AH4, some additional spare connectors on the outside of the trailer, uh, several actually. And so this way with patch cables, you can connect any radio to any antenna. All of the cabling inside the trailer for RF is RG142. So it's double shielded uh, Teflon, uh, very low loss and uh, very well shielded cable. All of the patch cables are also uh, RG142. So we really try to make a very clean installation and keep radios from interfering with each other. In addition to the uh, regular ham radio stuff, we also put up a, a high power range extended Wi-Fi access point. So this is the unit um, Velcroed to the roof rack. So we run a ethernet cable up to this transceiver. So we're running power over ethernet and data over the Cat5 cable. So there's no RF loss coming down from the antenna. This provides us with both two and five gig Wi-Fi access in a very large diameter uh, circle around the, uh, the campsite. Let's talk a bit about the electrical system. Uh, here's a schematic diagram of the basic system where you see it at the, at the very bottom is the battery bank. Uh, there are three big switches. There's one switch that takes the hot side of the batteries and completely disconnects the batteries from the entire system. We wanted to do this to minimize any, um, any load put on the batteries when it's in long-term storage. Uh, after the shutoff switch above that is a breaker. After the breaker is a low voltage disconnect unit, which is also Bluetooth enabled so we can monitor that. And then we get into the power bus. Uh, the power bus goes into a load switch, which then goes to uh, all of the distribution cabling to all of the loads inside the trailer. And you can see above that, we have two solar panels, each with its own charge controller, going into a charge select switch where you can select either the, uh, the solar panels or a built-in AC power supply charger. And you could pick either or of those or, or both off to the main power bus. And we're monitoring the whole load with a Victron Energy Bluetooth battery meter. So this meter is a Coulomb counter. So it knows when you fully charge the batteries and can give you an accurate depth of discharge indication. Uh, the batteries we use are lithium iron phosphate. So you can't just look at the uh, terminal voltage. So you really need to be able to know how much energy is being consumed. And the Victron does a great job of that. The batteries we chose for the build are Battleborn 100 amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries. These batteries uh, can pretty much be discharged down to zero uh, percent, but for the sake of planning, we assumed they would go down to 20 percent of uh, charge, worst case. That gives us about 240, 250 amp hours of capacity. We thought that'd be quite adequate. Uh, turns out that was more than sufficient for field day. Our base load, if we turn on every radio and every computer and every LCD panel, uh, the router, the, uh, the hotspot, everything without transmitting, we have about a 10 amp hour load. That also includes all the LED lighting, both underneath the, the shelves and also in the ceiling. So you can say, well, my base load is, is 10 amps and uh, then I'm gonna also add some variable load for my transmission. And we did a whole calculation and we, we concluded that this was uh, probably sufficient battery capacity for a very long weekend. Here's a close shot of the uh, electrical panel. 
So what you see on the left-hand side there are those three big power uh, shutoff switches. These are the typical marine style uh, 12 volt DC switching uh, switches. So you get them at any uh, marine supply or online. Uh, the box itself, you see two sets of meters. The top meter monitors the solar panels. So we know the voltage and the current coming from the solar panels. And then the round one is the Victron, which shows us the um, state of charge for the whole system. Inside the cabinet, uh, you can see there's a lot of wires running around. Uh, the left-hand side are two of the big uh, current shunts. Uh, in, in the middle, the uh, black and red big plastic covers is the, uh, the big uh, distribution strips. The blue square in the middle is the low voltage disconnect. Below that is the breaker. And above it all, the white box is a Genesun uh, solar charge controller that's hooked up to one of the two solar panels. And the right-hand side, you see the AC power supply charger if we're running off of shore power. The solar panels we're using are Borg RV monocrystalline panels. These are about 180 watt panels. So two of them gives us 360 watts of juice. Each panel has its own Genesun uh, charge controller and uh, we pipe that into that electrical system. Uh, we did notice that even though Genesuns are well engineered and they're uh, very low noise chargers, we did notice a very tiny bit of white noise and we put a large ferrite core as the, uh, as the, uh, the charge connections come into the electrical system and that completely eliminated that very low level noise. So it worked out great. We use ferrites all over the trailer. Uh, so here you can see uh, the, both the 12 volt DC going into the flex radio and the ethernet cable going into the flex before the radio is mounted in the network rack. So um, all of the radios um, are choked on the RF connections, on the power connections, on speakers, everything is, is choked. So we wanna completely eliminate any possibility of interference. This is a close up view of the big power switches. Uh, at the very top is our charge selector from the AC supply or solar. The second switch turns the load on and the bottom switch turns the battery on. The nice thing about this approach, by the way, is beside being uh, convenient, it's great because you can look at the state of the electrical system at a glance. So when the system is not being used, all of the switches are in the vertical position and you can just glance at it as you leave the trailer to make sure everything's off. Uh, you'll also notice that in the box on the left-hand side, the cables go straight into holes in the side of the, of the box. Uh, there's, uh, at this point, there's uh, some um, uh, like insulation material around, around that to reduce any chafing. The electrical box is plastic, so there's really no, no chance of um, cutting through that insulation and shorting anything out, but just in case we put some extra guard around. We added a, a, a 6U network rack and the top 1U is the, uh, is the coaxial patch bay. The next 1U down is the server and networking shelf. Uh, there's an empty space on the left-hand side there for the server. It happens to not be installed in this picture. Uh, in the middle is the hotspot and the right-hand side is a Wi-Fi access point router. Below that, the other four U are available for the uh, Flex 6400. So I also want to touch on some useful accessories that were not part of the of the actual um, permanent installation in the trailer, um, and, and a few actually a few things that are bolted in there. So um, the first thing is the Wi-Fi access point worked out really well. We use a Wavelink. This is a Wavelink um, high-powered access point. Uh, they say it's weatherproof. It looks reasonably weatherproof. Uh, we don't plan to leave it outside, but it would probably be okay. We put West Mountain rig runners uh, bolted to the wall under each of the operating positions. So we run large cables from the battery system. Um, we run into the distribution panels. Everything is uh, fused. Uh, it's easy to get to the fuses. They're right below the operating desks on the wall. We also, uh, at, the last, at the last minute, got some magnetic closing screen doors, and these turned out to be a wonderful addition. So there's one for the side door and one for the uh, double barn doors. Uh, they Velcro in place and uh, they magnetically snap closed. So this does a great job of keeping the bugs out and uh, turned out to be a really, really great accessory. I would highly recommend them. They're very inexpensive, super easy to install. And when we pack up, we just uh, pull them off of the Velcro mounts. As I mentioned, we have a ton of uh, ferrites, uh, mostly type uh, 31 and 43, of course. Under shelf lighting were these little discs. And where we went, there's no cellular coverage. We had very spotty coverage that would come and go. So we also had a Garmin inReach so we can send text messages if we needed to. One of the most uh, important accessories that we have permanently stored in the trailer is a ladder. 
These are really incredibly cool ladders because they collapse down to only a few feet tall and they extend up to about 10 or 12 feet, depending on the one you get. You can see the one we use there on the right-hand side makes it super easy for us to get up to all the clamps or do any maintenance on the top of the trailer, clean off the solar panels or write, route a coax cable. Uh, it turns out when we got to our campsite, we were able to be under a tree, which was great because that gave us some shade, but it also covered up our solar panels. So in addition to the permanently mounted solar panels, we also have in one of the um, extra storage uh, boxes in the trailer, a power film solar 120 watt a flexible solar panel and a buddy pole power mini that does a great job for uh, kind of on the run power for the, for the trailer. Uh, here you can see John uh, KJ6, KD6JL launching one of our NFED wires. So this is a pneumatic uh, tennis ball launcher that's about to shoot a, uh, a, a pole line over the trees. And then we used a uh, uh, rig expert to make sure that the antenna was tuned properly. So what did we learn from all this? Uh, the first thing we learned that was not originally planned for is to bring extra portable solar panels because um, you want to be under shade, which means it's not going to be optimum for, for uh, charging your battery system. So that was uh, the, the first uh, big takeaway. The second thing is 300 amp hours seems to be more than enough. And we were really concerned we would have uh, run out of juice, but turns out that's probably a really uh, respectable amount of energy. Now, since we've uh, built the trailer and used these batteries, I still recommend them. They're very high quality batteries. They're assembled here in the US. They're a very good uh, company to work with. Since then, there are other batteries that have come on the market that I would say are of similar quality and are significantly less expensive. There's also a lot of really crummy quality batteries and you can't tell because they're generally sealed. So you have to be really careful when you're picking uh, batteries. If you don't go with a big name brand like Battleborn, you really have to watch videos on YouTube of teardowns before you buy any of these batteries to make sure you're getting a quality product. The third thing that we learned was the combination of the flex mounted inside the trailer and the Maestro external to the trailer was really great. It was really fun to do that. It gave us both the flexibility of having the radio permanently mounted and really easy uh, to just set up and the flexibility of moving the control head around any place in the campsite and operating at our convenience. So that was really fun. And uh, I would also like to uh, mention that, you know, as the old saying goes, uh, less is more. Uh, I would recommend you really think through your system. Don't just get a trailer and throw a bunch of junk in it and sort it out later because you're gonna wind up spending your whole set up time just moving boxes around and not knowing where things are at. So really take the time to figure out what you really need. Make sure you do bring an appropriate amount of spares, obviously for things like, like wire and cables and connectors and uh, tools and all that sort of thing. But don't, don't overpack. Don't make this the junk storage bin. So the, the junkier it is, um, the less you're gonna use it. So in our build out, we wound up with a, an enormous amount of storage space that we're not using at all. And we're doing that very purposely. So under the desks, for example, there's almost nothing that's stored under the desks. We wanna leave it uh, clear because when we go to do an event, we don't wanna spend a half hour just moving stuff around. We just wanna uh, set up the trailer, put up the antennas, hit the button and be on the air. Likewise, when we pack up to go, we want it to be a 10 minute process to, to just shut everything off, pull down the antennas, hop in the car and then take off. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'd be uh, very happy to take questions.